Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Bernard Alvarez webcast. Uh, we're here every Tuesday with a live broadcast as well as our premiere on my YouTube channel every Friday at noon. Every week, I try to share with you either something to expand your consciousness, share with you uh, one of my little mini consciousness talks, or uh, we like to have somebody come on and share their wisdom, their experience, and offer you some new knowledge uh, to put into your toolbox on uh, awakening, enlightenment, uh, compassion, and uh, expanding our consciousness as uh, individual beings and or a collective whole here on our planet. Uh, today, I'm very excited uh, with our guests. Uh, I've been looking forward to this talk. I always look forward to the talks, so or I wouldn't have them on the show, actually. <laughs> but uh, I've been reading up on uh, our guests today, and uh, I, I think it's going to be a very, very good show. Uh, before that, I just wanted to welcome everybody to fall. It is finally fall. I know uh, the fall equinox was last week, and uh, I... I was out of town for most of it, and I think we had the webcast uh, the day after or something like that. Uh, so I didn't really have an opportunity to share any of my fall spirituality techniques or meditations with you. Uh, but, you know, right around the bend is uh, Day of the Dead, Samhain, Halloween, and I'm sure we'll be doing something very interesting uh, for that. As well, I just wanted to let you know, those of you that are weekly viewers, uh, there will not be a webcast next week. Uh, I do have another pressing matter that I need to take care of. I'm working on several projects as much as you know, and uh, I need to work on this other project next week, so there will not be a webcast. Uh, following that, I'm looking forward to have some of my uh, co-speakers, uh, as you know, many of you know, I was on the Spirit Heart uh, Cruise, the Visionary Conference at Sea, and we had about 30 other speakers beside myself. And I got to meet a lot of people, and I'm looking forward to having some of them uh, come on the webcast, and I believe I'm going to have one scheduled in about two weeks. So look, keep an eye out for that. Um, anyway, it's been a great week. Uh, it's still very hot here in Roanoke, Virginia. And I am looking forward uh, to some lovely fall weather, even more like orange today. Hopefully, it'll bring in the uh, fall, <laughs> the fall vibe going on here. It's it's October, but it feels like summer. Um, anyway, so as as you all know, I'm very very much a promoter and uh, how do they say an influencer of enlightenment and compassion and empathy and whatnot. And uh, compassion and empathy happen to be one of my major how should we say, my major tools that I utilize uh, when I try to share uh, spiritual knowledge and wisdom. For me, it is a foundation. So uh, doc, uh, Dr. Stephen G. Post is joining me today, and uh, on his, his, he has a new book. Let me share you, show you the book cover so you all know. We'll talk more about that uh, after we have Stephen talk to us for a little bit. Uh, but in his book, he talks about how it's good to be good, that kindness, compassion, and love heal in countless ways. So when we contribute to lives of others by kindness and helping, we discover happiness and resilience. Each of us is a healer when we are kind and helpful to others, and especially to those who are suffering due to illness, loss, disappointment, humiliation, rejection, or a thousand other things. Compassion is active kindness and response to suffering, and it always heals at so many levels. For those of you that don't know much about my guest, let me tell you that uh, Dr. Stephen G. Post is a PhD for over 20 years. Uh, he has spread the scientifically-based benefits of giving and committing to the greater good across the globe. He lives and teaches the uplifting message that by giving to others, we become our fullest selves. Uh, he is the author of Good at God and Love on Route 80, The Hidden Mystery of Human Connectedness, and lead author of the best-selling Why Good Things Happen to Good People, How to Live Happier, Healthier, Longer Life by the Simple Act of Giving. For over two decades, he has been part of the Alzheimer care communities. He is the founding director of the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love and the founding director of the Center for Medical Humanities, Compassionate Care, and Bioethics at Stony Brook University in New York. So I am so very grateful to have someone like you on today's webcast. How are you, Stephen? Welcome. Oh, 
I'm fine. I think it's a little cooler up here than it is down in Virginia. So my, I, I'm sure it probably is. From what I understand, though, by not much, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's been a warm fall, for sure. <laughs> so you have definitely, um, you're following a, a, a very parallel path uh, to myself, actually. And, but you've taken it to, I would say, an academic and scientific level. So thank you for, for doing this work for humanity. I feel it's a very important. You're most welcome. I wouldn't do anything else. You too. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, so, Stephen, uh, today you were talking, a little bit before the show, Stephen and I were talking, he was he wanted to, he wants to share uh, a bit of a story. Of, is it about compassion? I kind of lost uh, the title and the translation. What are you going to be sharing with us today? Well, uh, I was going to tell you and your viewers a journey story, uh, you know, something that's a, a different kind of road trip, if you will. And uh, that's really exciting because it's about synchronicity and premonition. And it's really what got me started uh, on a lifelong uh, journey. And I founded these institutes on empathy and compassion and the benefits of helping others. And, and it's, been a great, uh, it's been a great trip. But sometimes um, people miss the, the, the deeper question of, you know, why do I do the things that I do? And that's where a dream comes in uh, when I was an adolescent, and I wanted to talk about that for a few minutes. Please do. That sounds wonderful. Thank you. Okay. So, um, you know, I've been in academic medical settings for 30 years, Chicago, Ann Arbor, Michigan, 20 years at Case Western in Cleveland, 11 years at Stony Brook, and I've always loved helping students learn to interact with patients empathically, to be attentive listeners, uh, and to really take pride in their communication skills because love heals. And communication is a part of that love. And to be present, to be affectively present with their empathy and not just kind of you know cognitively present. So um, I've emphasized that and been able to work really well with lots of people, it's been great. Uh, written books about uh, the helpers high and uh, the givers glow and all those kinds of things that have done nicely. But why do I do this? This is the interesting question, you know, for me anyway. Uh, so I, I was 15 years old and I was up in a boarding school in Concord, New Hampshire. And I would wake up in the morning, it was an Episcopal boarding school. Um, and uh, I had a recurring dream. It recurred five times in my 16th year. And it would be early morning. I wasn't quite sure if I was asleep or awake. It was kind of betwixt and between. Uh, and uh, I had this really amazing dream. Um, it was misty. It was gray. Uh, you couldn't really see much past your nose but I knew I was on a road to the West. And on my left, I saw a young guy with stringy blonde hair, not quite like yours. And he was <laughs> on a ledge leaning out over the water, looking like he was about to jump. And then the mist disappeared and there was the face of a blue angel. I wasn't a believer in angels, by the way, but uh, the face of a blue angel. And in a feminine voice, the angel said, if you save him, you too shall live. And so if you save him, you too shall live. Mm -hmm. And we had required chapel every morning. So at eight o'clock, I would go early about 7.30 and I just meditate on this dream. And I wondered what it meant. I wasn't sure if I was just making it up because kids make things up, you know, and we're all kind of desperately seeking meaning. Sometimes we go on real detours, but it, it, it recurred five or six times. And that gave me the sense that maybe it was more of a message uh, than I was able to receive. So I was very curious about it. And I'd talk, I had a wonderful sacred studies teacher named Rod Wells, who was an Episcopal priest and a friend of Alan Watts, who was a, a, a Buddhist out on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we were very close. So I told Rod about the dream. 
and he was a di divinity school grad from Yale University. So once upon a time, I was in my 16th year, he took me down to New Haven, it was the first time I'd been in New Haven, from Concord, New Hampshire, and um, I spent three hours in a class on adolescent spirituality with a Jungian professor there named James Diddies. And they asked me about 15 people there who were studying for ministry asked me about the dream. And, and I said, well, you know, up in New Hampshire, we all read uh, Emerson's Oversoul. Uh, I think I'm the only one who really believes it. I think I'm the only one who believes that our minds have a non-local element, that uh, they're not just tissue, they're not just brain, they're not just cells. Uh, but in fact, uh, we participate in a larger infinite mind, I used to use that term, and, and was very much engaged in that sort of thinking. Uh, and, I, and, and I said, the road to the West, well, you know, it, it strikes me as powerful. I'm not sure about it. I don't know what the dream really means, but I applied to Reed College in Portland, Oregon, where no St. Paul's kids ever went. You know, they were all going to East Coast schools. And uh, so this went on for a few hours. We had a really deep talk about the idea of a unifying mind, a cosmic consciousness that we are all part of, and that our minds are, are, are a gift of that consciousness to us, and not something that's just derivative from matter, right? And um, so um, I graduated. I was supposed to go to Swarthmore, actually. But that summer, Rod, my teacher, had gotten me a really nice job in the Bronx tutoring. And I'd done that up in New Hampshire with French Canadian kids. I loved it. But my parents put their foot down. They said, no, it's too dangerous in the Bronx. You can't do that. And we had a big argument for two or three days. And finally, my mom, she just said, look, I don't want you in the Bronx. And, and if you insist on this, I'm not going to cover Swarthmore for you. So I said, all right, what am I going to do if I can't tutor? My dad worked in New York and he knew all the owners of uh, lampshade factories and furniture factories. He ran a department store on Fifth Avenue. And he said, I know what you can do. You can work in Bill de Bono's lampshade factory in Patchogue, which is this town on the South Shore of Long Island. Now, I said, okay, very reluctantly, my dad had a secondhand gray Mercedes 190 that had seen a lot better days. And, and I think he only bought it so he could drive me up to New Hampshire and kind of look cool, you know. Not that he was a bad guy, but that's how he thought. So I actually drove this car to the lampshade factory, and I was good for two weeks. I was between two very, very large Italian women, Maria and Cassandra. They were nice folks, and I was cutting cardboard. It was sweaty. There was no air conditioning. It was hotter than Roanoke. And uh, after two weeks, I decided, you know what? This is enough. So I drove out to West Hampton Beach, which is a little further out on the island, where I had a couple of friends there, and about 11 at night, with my copy of Siddhartha in my pocket, and uh, you know a few other classics of the, of the time, uh, I said, I'm driving west, because the dream was a lure to me. Again, I didn't know if it was really that serious or significant yet, or if it would ever come true, or what I could ever figure out what the dream was about. But I had a push. See, the big push was, this argument in my family, and the pull was the dream. So I took that car and I drove west on the Sunrise Highway. I drove through the Midtown Tunnel, I drove up the FDR, I drove over the George Washington Bridge, and then there's two signs. One says 95 South, well, there was no South in the dream. The other says Route 80 West. So I went west, and about five in the morning, um, I'm just thinking, you know, I'm not going to follow this dream after all, because if I do a U-turn and go over the midway and I get home, my reputation will be untarnished. But lo and behold, and I think this was kind of alchemy, okay? You know, you can tell me what you think, Bernard. I'm curious. Just as I was about to turn around, cars back in those days had generators. And when the generators went out, the lights went out, the engine closed down, everything shut down in like an instant, literally. And so I was just able to make it to the right shoulder. I was at the Lewisburg exit on Route 80, smack dab in the middle of big Pennsylvania, which is a long state. And what was I going to do? There was a little bit of light rising. 
I looked for miles. There were wheat fields, corn fields, nothing else. So I did what a kid would do. I took out a piece of paper from the glove compartment and I wrote in pencil to the Pennsylvania State Police, please return this car to Henry A. V. Post, 44 Davison Lane, West Islip, New York, 516-669-5655, from his son, Stephen, who no longer works in the lampshade factory. <laughs> That's what I did. And I had my classical guitar, I had a couple of books, I had 50 bucks in my wallet, I stuck my thumb out and this big, huge white truck came by, a guy flung the door open, he was dressed country and western, uh, he said, I'm Gary, where are you going, boy? And I said, West. And he said, well, I can get you to Chicago. He got me to Chicago. He was a really interesting guy. He was very prayerful. And uh, uh, we talked about a lot of deep things. He dropped me off at Grant Park. I played a guitar on the benches for a couple of days, Villalobos, Torrega, Granados, made a little more money, fell in with a group of hippies who had a micro bus, and they were going to San Francisco. So I said, okay, I'm going with you. We got into Nebraska, and where Route 80 runs through Nebraska, and just around Lincoln, one of these young gals said to me, you know, you really ought to call your mom. So I called my mom, collect, and she said, oh, Stevie, you're alive. We called the Pinkertons. And I said, mom, why'd you call the Pinkertons? Didn't you get my memo? <laughs> Did you get my note? And she said, well, we got your note, and we should have let you teach in the Bronx, Anyway, the car is home, it's in the shop, and where are you headed? And I said, I'm going out to San Francisco, and I'm going to spend the summer, I think, with Cousin George. So I went out, and I spent, um, spent a month with George, and I was doing chanting at a Nichiren Shosho Buddhist temple, Nam Yoho Renge Kyo, and playing guitar in the Mission District. It was great, but I drew a bad draft number. So at that point, I called the people at Reed, because I'd already turned them down. I said, look, I don't really want to go to Vietnam. It's not my kind of war. Uh, and so can you make a place for me, which they did. And so in early September, about seven in the morning, I left the temple, George, uh, my mentor, Gus, and a lot of people were there. And I took the bus up Market Street to Golden Gate Park. I walked across the park, which is a pretty long walk. It's about a 15 minute walk. And I, crawled, and I walked up the, the Golden Gate Bridge, and it was misty, it was gray. I, I couldn't see more than about a foot or two in front of me. I was on the left-hand side on the pedestrian walkway, and then there was a kind of a waist-high fencing, uh, and on the other side was a ledge. I got to the middle of the bridge, and I heard a shuffling. I couldn't quite figure it out, but as I looked carefully, I made out the shape of a youth with stringy blonde hair. And I looked at him, I was kind of shocked. And I said, I'm hoping that you're not planning to jump. Now I said that lightly and empathically. And mind you, I'm only like hitting 17, right? And he said, what's it to you? And he lashed out at me and he even uh, screamed out some Macbeth about empty nothingness. And I said, you know, I feel that way too, but I'm not sure I do anymore because one of the reasons I think I'm here on this bridge is because two years ago, right, 3,000 miles away, as a kid in New Hampshire, I had this dream and I told him about the dream. And I said, maybe all these things happen. I had this incredible falling out with my family. Uh, the Mercedes broke down on Route 80 near Lewisburg. I wrote the note to the Pennsylvania State Police. Uh, I called mom, collect from uh, 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 a phone booth. I got out to cousin George's and I think I'm here for some reason because I'm supposed to encounter you, I'm supposed to meet you. And I know it sounds wacky and he, he said, you're absolutely crazy. And I said, well, maybe I am, but you know, uh, I think I can help you. And he said, how can you help me? Again, he was really indignant. And I said, I've got something. I've got a present for you. So I reached into my backpack and I pulled out this scroll. It was about this big. And it's called the Gohon Zone, which is a, like a Japanese Buddhist scroll. And um, 
I said, look, if I give you this scroll, it's going to change your life. You're going to have good luck from here on out. You're not going to be out on that ledge about to jump into the sea. And I told him a little bit more about it. And then, and I said, look, if you want this, you have to come over this railing onto my side, and then I'll explain it to you. And believe it or not, he did. He came over the ledge and we stood there and I unscrolled this thing and I explained some of the Japanese symbols like um, the universal mind symbol, uh, the symbol of busy being a heart with a line through it, like having no heart and, and, and how we need to get beyond time to connect with one another. It was really beautiful and I'd spent the summer kind of studying Gahon zones at the temple. And, and I said, I'm gonna give this to you, but you have to promise me that you'll walk south on the bridge, because I have to walk north up to Oregon, and you'll walk across the park, you'll get the bus, I gave him some money, and here's a note to my cousin George. He said, it's in the book actually, dear George, this is Harry, please let him sleep on your floor where I slept. George was a superintendent of an apartment building, you know, like the Vietnam vet subculture people were. and and. And, and, and I said, George, take Harry down to the temple, let him meet Gus, and try to help him out. And um, so then we shook hands. I said goodbye to Harry. And I went north. I put my thumb out right at the end of the bridge. And this green pickup truck came along. And a guy, again, f trucks were always in, the, in this, flung a door open and said, hey there, my name's Dwayne Dill. Yep, D-I-L-L, -L, just like in Dill Pickle. And this here's my wife, Dorothy. And where are you going? And I said, north. And he said, well, we can get you almost to Oregon. So I went off on this wonderful ride on the Pacific Coast Highway. And, and so I wondered as I, was, as I was walking down the bridge, you know, how could it be that I may have encountered the young guy in my dream, but my dream was, you know, two years earlier and 3,000 miles away. It was like, you know, of course, uh, you know, a few months later, I would be taking a course uh, called Alchemy 101, which was a combination of quantum physics and the history of science with none other than Steve Jobs, who slept on my floor at Reed College. I won't go into that right now, but I will tell you that uh, I, I realized that this idea of a non-local mind, I love Larry Dossi's stuff, the idea of a non-local mind, uh, this is why people like Raman Nujan could have inspired uh, uh, visions of mathematical formulas without any background in math, write them down in the dirt with his finger, put them down in his notebook later as a teenager, and then wind up, those notebooks are in the middle of Trinity College Library at Cambridge University, I've seen them, and they're the basis of quantum physics in the modern era. So there's something about mind that is completely mysterious, and this encounter, this is why the subtitle of God and Love on Route 80 is the hidden meaning of human connectedness was astonishing to me. And I never looked at life or the world um, the same. I always just understood that when we're helping others, we're in the right spiritual zone and we're protected from these negative downward spirals into hostility and bitterness, that the best thing we can do for our own hearts and minds and bodies and souls and healing is to contribute to the lives of others and to do that meaningfully. And so the rest of my life, uh, I have been you know, teaching in major universities and sometimes getting some flack over it because not everybody accepts this and trying to bring science and, and the best of science to these things. Fortunately, I met Sir John Templeton uh, in, in uh, 1990, and, and, and we eventually founded the Institute for Research on Unlimited Love. And, and he said, you know, I don't want you to study just human love, but he said, I want you to be able to study those experiences that people have spiritually, where they almost feel invaded by a love that is more pure and wise and lasting and uh, and widespread than just mere human love, because he said he was kind of pessimistic about human love. He thought, you know, look, it gets myopic, uh, it kind of grows faint, it reverses itself into hatred, uh, it, it, it overindulges and, and makes unwise decisions for the very people it loves, you know. So he said, I'm really interested in your studying the spiritual experience that people have in all these traditions, 
of this profound higher love that just kind of comes into their consciousness, you know, from without, but also from within. And so we were able to do that and fun things at ions and, you know, love studies and all sorts of stuff. And that's been my life interest, but it all began with a dream when I was 15. And um, I know it sounds like a crazy dream, but it turns out Harry, Harry did okay. Uh, he went home to North Carolina. I never saw him again, but it, at Thanksgiving, everybody filled me in. And then there were other things. So this, the book is just a series of episodes of synchronicity, every one of them uh, really formative of my own sense of calling and mission uh, in life, whether it's to the deeply forgetful or to healthcare professionals. And I've tried to pull this off within you know, kind of established medical centers, and I've been able to do it, thank, thank heavens. I mean, that's been, a lot of that has been just uh, way beyond my expectations. I, 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 well, first of all, I love your story. I think that um, we have a lot of parallels in the work that we do, absolutely. And um, I, I have like 30,000 questions after this particular story, but I do want to point out Yay on carrying Siddhartha with you. I used to carry that around in my 20s. <laughs> yeah. And, um, as, you know, you mentioned earlier about uh, is it alchemy or, or whatnot. I, I, I kind of see it as um, divine intervention slash inspiration that we, it's kind of unfolding before us before we even realize it. And you, you, trusted it and you went with it and you had the courage to follow through with that and it, i mean look what a wonderful path it led you to if, if i had to look i mean graduates of saint paul's they, i mean like jp morgan i mean they all wind up in law firms they all wind up on wall street a lot of them are unhappy some of them are successful and happy but they're so locked into the sort of social expectations of their quote-unquote class and and, and, and I just needed to be free of that. And, and eventually, you know, I mean, I actually had a little career in science at, at uh, you know, I did pediatric hermaphrodism. I did uh, stuff in immunology at Penn, but I quit all that. And I went to where all blue angel dreamers have to go, Bernard. Right. I went to the Divinity School of the University of Chicago, and I got to study with Mersha Eliade, the author of Shamanism, mm -hmm. and Joseph Campbell, who was there for a couple of years. He was mostly on the East Coast. And Chick sent me high and all these wonderful people and really study um, spirituality and the history of religions. And, and I never wanted to get back into medicine, but at the end of that period, uh, they kind of heard that I had some basic science. So I started teaching in the medical school there, and then the rest is history. But I've been able fortunately to kind of integrate spirituality and health and medicine in a way that's kind of, you know, met the litmus test uh, in, in these medical schools over the years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, I, I can imagine with the linear logical thinking that goes on within the scientific community, how difficult it is to adapt or, or translate this type of metaphysical knowledge onto something so linear logical, you know? <laughs> You got to have mirth. I mean, you have mirth, and that's that's a really key quality. I don't think I would have been able to do this. You can't. I'm sort of an activist on this, and you can't be mm -hmm. successful if you're always kind of overbearing and heavy-handed. So I got to Stony Brook like 11 years ago, and and uh, you know, our, my first night there, my family was struggling because they were missing Cleveland, and that was where we'd raised our kids. And and so, what could I do? It was a terrible night. I went out to get some pizza. <laughs> Like a good dad would do. And I walked into Little Joe's Pizzeria, and there in the foyer on the rack was a newspaper article from a paper I'd never heard of, the Three Village Herald. And the only thing it said on the front page was, unlimited love comes to Stony Brook. So some cub reporter had gone online, and I'd done a lot of press about the Institute, and she'd actually interviewed the dean of our medical school, who was a kidney transplant surgeon and the chairman of my department. And they said, well, we really didn't hire him to study unlimited love, but we think he can teach communication skills and empathy and work with students nicely. 
So the first day I came to work, I'm going up the escalator in the middle of the medical school. And there's a guy who looks kind of like Mr. Clean. He's like got big arms and he's crossed like this. And I, don't, I surprisingly picked me out because I guess he looked at my picture online. And he looked down and he said, are you Dr. Post? I was about, you know, halfway up the escalator. Everybody could hear, you know. And he's up there and he's very stern looking. And he said, are you going to save us? <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, and I, and I said to him, well, <clears throat> no, sir, but I'm glad to be here. And we eventually became very good friends. Turns out he's a very good violinist. And he's actually kind of a Hasidic uh, Jew with a lot of interest in uh, a sort of Kabbalistic themes. Mm -hmm. So we connected. But what I found is that, you know, by being mirthful and being able to laugh a little bit at myself, and not being heavy-handed, you know, I've been able to work pretty well in these in these environments. Well, I'm very grateful you have, and I'm I am very pleasantly surprised of the success of the work that you've done. So thank you for for doing that. Now, tell us a, a little bit uh, a little bit about the book. Is the book already out? Yeah, it's out. It came out about three or four weeks ago. It's got a nice forward by Larry Dossie, who's got to be one of the nicest people you'll ever meet because I emailed him and he, uh, and he, he wrote a blur, but then he wrote me and he said, can I write a, a forward? So it's all about the, you know, the one mind concept and the physics and the philosophical and the spiritual side of it going all the way back to, you know, Plotinus and all the way up to Einstein. So it's really a beautiful intro. And I needed that because it sets the book up because the book is, is, is about the journey. It's about, mm -hmm. You know, it starts with the dream and, and it goes through all these experiences, which include, by the way, I mean, really interestingly, I, uh, in 1985, I, was, I, I, I actually took a break from medical schools and I taught for three years in philosophy at Fordham Marymount in New York um, and taught on philosophy of love. And when I got there, I had an office mate, a really nice office mate. It looked kind of like E.T. His name was Gabe Gomez. And he said, what got you into spirituality and, and all this? And I said, Gabe, this is in the book. You know, I said, when I was a kid, I had this dream, a recurring dream, and dreams that recur. I mean, there's got to be something more to them than dreams that don't recur. And I wasn't sure, but I took a gamble. And he said, you've got to go to Peconico Hills, to the Union Church, which is, where, which is behind Terrytown and it's the Rockefeller Enclave. And he said, there's this huge picture of the stained glass window of the Good Samaritan that takes up the whole back of the church and it's by Mark Chagall. And Chagall was a very spiritual artist, you know? Mm -hmm. And I loved it. And then I started reading about Chagall and it turns out when he was 17, he lived in a small Russian city. His dad had a factory, <laughs> okay? And they pickled herring. And he wanted his son, Mark, to follow that course. Mm -hmm. but Mark ran away and went to St. Petersburg and he had no money and he was out on the streets pretty much homeless, but he sketched. He didn't paint yet. And then one, and he writes this in, a, in his book called My Life, like about 15 years later. He was in an alley sleeping on a mattress. There was a little bit of a lean-to roof over him and another, a working man who was really big and burly, he describes him. And Chagall isn't sure if he's asleep or awake, but the alley fills with blue light, and then it fills with the fluttering white wings of an angel. And then the angel disappears, the light ascends, and the next morning, Chagall painted his first painting. It's called The Apparition, and it's of a blue angel with wings. And all of his stuff, whether it's in the UN or wherever, it all, um, it all has that. He even died in his studio outside of Paris painting the blue angel. So I started writing a little bit on Chagall and they, they invited me in 2014 to, to go to Peconico Hills to the union church. I gave a talk on Chagall and that night I got home to Stony Brook, went to my little computer and I had an email from Dureya Maud, who's a feminist mystic in Lahore, Pakistan. And she's on the board of the Institute. And she said, the Institute website has been taken down. There was only one flag on it. It said, Team DZ ISIS. So it was one of the early websites that had been taken down in that period when that was happening. Right. 
And I didn't know quite what to do, but I talked with my board and we had an international essay contest for people from all over the world to write essays reflectively on how they pushed back against peer pressure to hate other people just because they didn't share in their beliefs. Mm -hmm. We got thousands of essays. We had an international panel. Uh, and, it, and at that time, I was co-chairing this program on spirituality and sustainable development for the UN Population Fund. They got wind of this. So believe it or not, this is synchronicity, okay? It's like taking something negative and making it into very positive things, expanding the canvas. It's what life is about. That's my teaching. So that very difficult moment but we actually filled the entire United Nations headquarters in August of 2016 on World Youth Day with people from all over the globe. Some of them had won our awards and they had cash prizes and they, they did their presentations on universal love and pushing back against religious hatred. Some of them did it rap style. Some of them did it with violins in their hands. It was all over the map. And it was piped out to 80 million young people globally. And, and, and so that's really the, the core of the story is, you know, look, the, the car can stop on Route 80. Um, you can get your website taken down in a kind of difficult way, but life is always about taking these moments where things look bad, just like when I saw that article in the Three Village Herald, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, but it's about expanding the canvas. And, you know, it's like a Pollock painting where he starts with just a gob of goo that looks like hell. But by the end, he's got all these energetic, beautiful lines, and it's a great piece of, of, of work. So, mm -hmm. so the, the core teaching of the book is always expand the canvas and feel the presence, notice. That's Larry Dossi's you know, concept, be a noticer. Notice the winks and the whispers of this cherishing love. And if you stay in that zone, you will be guided along and things will work out, no matter how bleak they might seem. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for that, Stephen. Well, we have to wrap things up. We are out of time. And I just want to say you have been an inspiration to me today. And I'm going to carry your words with me, hopefully for the rest of my life, at least for the rest of today. But, <laughs> That's good enough. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, I would love to talk to you more again in the future, have you back on uh, when we have a little bit more time to discuss even more stories, because you seem to have so much experience uh, with many of the people who I look up to. Uh, Joseph Campbell was a huge uh, influence in my early uh, spiritual development, I will say. But uh, your website is stephengpost.com, is that correct? Yes, yeah, Stephen with a PH. Yeah. Stephen with a PH, gpost.com. And then also you have unlimitedloveinstitute.org. Yes, yeah. Is that correct? Very good. Yeah. Well, everybody, the name of the book is God in Love on Route 80. I noticed that there's the uh, the Golden Gate Bridge there on the cover, or is that the Washington Bridge? <laughs> no, that, that's, that's, that's the Bay Bridge. Uh, oh, okay. Because it's part of Route 80. And the oh, I see. Okay, very, uh, so very That's good. why Bre Brenda Knight decided they'd go with the Bay Bridge, even though the actual encounter occurred on the Right. Okay. Well, there's still okay. synchronicities and layers of yeah. synchronicities there. Anyway, so the book is available at all major booksellers and Amazon.com. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Yes, it Very is. good. All right, everybody. Well, that's our webcast for today. I want to thank, again, I want to thank Stephen G. Post for joining me today. And uh, please remember, I will not be back next week. I'm going to uh, be working on something else, but I'll be back in two weeks. Have a wonderful fortnight, as they used to say. And <laughs> Oh, wait, what is that? What's two weeks again? Score? <laughs> a score. <laughs> Something like that. Have a good score. I'm thinking Fortnite is the, uh, the video game. Anyway, uh, I love you all. Have a wonderful week. I will see you all very soon. Bye-bye. Take care. Take care okay. now.